I'd like to welcome you again to our second uh, Climate Outlook. This one is for winter. It's here on December 17th, so in the future we hope to get this a little bit earlier in the month, but it's just been busy with the weather that we had and all the things that have been going on. So, but my name is Larry Hopper. I work for the National Resource Office here in New Braunfels for the Austin San Antonio WFO. We've also got Aaron Treadway, who is on the climate team with me, and uh, Jason Running, who is our decision support uh, focal point and also lead forecaster here at the office. Uh, so this time I didn't go ahead and show the precipitation because we know we've had a lot of rainfall uh, towards the end of October uh, between uh, Hurricane Patricia's moisture and the big event that we had at the end of October. And then we actually had quite a bit of rain in November, December as well, right around normal for most areas, some below, some above. Uh, but what you can see here is that that short-term flash drought that we were uh, concerned about during the last callback in October did continue to intensify right up to the Hurricane uh, Patricia moisture event. Uh, that occurred in late October. You can see that 50% of the state was in a D1, D4 drought. We actually had significant drought conditions across the I-35 corridor and much of our hill country and coastal plains as well. But after that single event, we only had 15% of the state in drought. And then after uh, the record precipitation event that we had uh, here in the Austin San Antonio area on October 30th and some additional precipitation next week, we quickly reduced our drought conditions to just a little tiny sliver of northwest Texas. Uh, so once again, don't really have any drought conditions. We don't anticipate any drought conditions moving forward because of the El Nino that we're currently in. So these strong El Nino conditions are predicted to continue uh, as we go on. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that even though our sea surface temperatures here are quite impressive, they're 2.8 degrees Celsius, uh, which is upwards of around right around 5 degrees Fahrenheit here in the Nino 3.4 region above what they normally would be in the East Pacific. These have peaked. Last week they were at 3.0 degrees Celsius and it does appear from all models and observations moving forward that this will continue to begin to decrease as we go throughout the next several months. But this once again is a very impressive El Nino with a very nice warm tongue of warm water extending further into the Central Pacific. Uh, similar to the 97-98 El Nino and the 82-83 El Nino, we do expect this will be one of the three strongest if not even stronger El Ninos that we have seen. So once again, uh, as you can see here, this is an El Nino that's similar to those two El Ninos, albeit maybe slightly different uh, evolutions in how they developed and how they'll weaken. Again, models are indicating that this El Nino has peaked in strength uh, and is beginning to uh, come down a little bit, but we do expect that the strong El Nino conditions are having the sea surface temperatures above 1.5 degrees Celsius will continue on through most of this winter and then will continue to weaken throughout the spring to where we do expect that the El Nino conditions will end by late spring or early summer. You can kind of see in these images here as we go from January on through March, April, May, these conditions do gradually weaken. Some models actually do predict, like you have up here in the IRI a plume up here, which will come out, I believe, on today or tomorrow, the updated one, is showing some indication that we may actually go into La Nina. So uh, that's one thing that does happen a lot, and we'll watch for that for the next several months to see if that's what's going to happen, because obviously those of you who know about that know that La Nina is typically a very dry uh, pattern for us. But that's going to be later. This is now. So what you see is that El Nino typically is going to cause us to have a northward displacement of our polar jet, which keeps most of the country fairly warm and does cause us to have a more active subtropical jet. Now, obviously, that has not happened the last several days here. And we're in kind of a, a pattern where we're going to be pretty warm for the next couple weeks. Uh, but typically in El Nino, as you've seen uh, for the last several weeks, we do have a pretty active subtropical jet that gives us repeated chances for rainfall and occasionally some winter weather as well if the temperatures are cold enough. So again, even though the Pacific Ocean is pretty far away from Central Texas, uh, and even though the Central Pacific and the East Pacific where these uh, changes are happening in the tropics are pretty far, they can still cause these linkages to cause some average differences to our climatic patterns for the weather that we see in the next three months or so. So how does El Nino typically affect Texas weather? Well, usually uh, during December to February in South Central Texas, we have much wetter and cooler conditions than we normally would, uh, especially from the wet standpoint. Typically, we're 30 to 50 percent wetter than normal, which is uh, a couple of inches for most places. This trend is not just a trend that holds a few times, 
This is a trend that holds more than half the time. Now for the temperatures, this is a little bit trickier and we'll get more into what this means in a little bit. We usually just have slightly cooler than normal temperatures. And again, this is a trend that holds 60 to 70% of the time. So far this El Nino does not appear to be holding. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how what this really means is a, a difference in our low temperatures and our, uh, sorry, our high temperatures being cooler than normal. Our low temperatures may actually be slightly warmer than normal. So we'll get to that in just a second. So again, uh, looking forward for the next kind of next two weeks, which I know a lot of you care about since the holidays are coming up, uh, you can see that our one part of the country that's predicted to be below normal precipitation wise is our Rio Grande Plains uh, on into uh, near the I-35 corridor. They have kind of odds that are equally tilted or tilted towards uh, drier than normal conditions. Of course, as we go through the second week, we do expect to get uh, some deeper troughs through here that will increase our rain chances uh, for the second week uh, moving forward. And that's for most of the country. So this is a pretty wet pattern for most of the country. It's just not going to be a real wet pattern for us uh, for the next several days until we get to week two. Temperatures themselves, I'm sure you've been seeing all across the news how temperatures are much warmer than normal across the east coast of the United States. And obviously it's been warmer than normal for us as well. Of course, tomorrow will be a little bit chillier than normal. But for the next several days, we expect to have temperatures outside of tomorrow will be in the 50s. Uh, they'll be in the 60s and 70s for the next several days. And so uh, that's going to probably continue into at least the first part of week two. And then once we get past Christmas, we might start to see some cooling, uh, depending upon which model run you believe, uh, as that spreads in, that trough spreads in from the West Coast. So uh, what does that mean, though, once we get past this period? Well, this is what we saw before the new outlooks came out today. Previously, you saw that they were clinging to wetter than normal conditions for December, and then temperature was kind of equal chance to our north. We we're kind of on the cusp of being below normal or above normal. Uh, you can see that the December to February temperature and precipitation the totals showed that we were anticipating to transition to even wetter and cooler than normal temperatures. The new outlooks come out, and I just want to toggle back and forth a little bit so you can see the December to February outlooks at the bottom versus the January to March outlooks. What you see there is they're still clinging to having cooler than normal conditions, or at least a tilt towards cooler than normal conditions for South Central Texas as we go deeper into the winter. Uh, we still are expecting uh, continued wetter than normal conditions, uh, which in winter doesn't take much since our, our uh, monthly precip for much of our areas right around two inches for each of these next three months. A lot of you already saw that uh, this past weekend with one single event. Uh, so what you're seeing here, though, is that the January, if I toggle back and forth between January and February, you see January is predicted to still be cooler than uh, warmer, uh, sorry, wetter than normal. But then you also see that there's a little bit of a signal here that suggests that we are starting to get that equal chance to where we're really not sure if it's going to be above normal, below normal temperatures for January. So it looks like south part of central te south central Texas will probably be below normal, but the northern parts and north parts of Texas itself may actually have an equal chance of either way. So there seems to be that model trends are and the forecast trends from CPC are to bring us back to kind of a more question mark about temperatures, but still maintaining that we're probably going to be wetter than normal. Whereas as we get deeper into, into winter, we do expect to transition to cool to normal temperatures. So I do want to kind of cover this one more time like I did last time. What do these outlooks really mean? And so to kind of understand what these outlooks mean, you have to see that each of these colors, the green colors for this three-month outlook for precipitation versus the brown colors versus the white, each of those three colors stands for a different kind of tercile or, or a group of three uh, for what we mean for precipitation. So the top group of three, the top third is above normal precipitation, sorry. Uh, the middle third is near normal where we have the equal chance of no tilt either way. And the bottom third is where we have drier than normal conditions. And what you see here is that to be in the top third for winter in San Antonio, even though our normal precipitation is just 5.46 inches, our top third is actually 5.33 inches. So typically, we either have really dry winters here or we have really wet winters. So it doesn't take much to get into that top third, and that's why we're really confident that we're most likely going to be in the top third of precipitation totals uh, with this El Nino. And you start looking through this list, these top four are all El Nino years, uh, including uh, the strongest El Nino that we had in 97-98. When you start to look at the bottom third, you don't really see very many, if actually, if any of those El Nino years, uh, and most of those are La Nina years. And so what you're seeing here is that in this case, we have a 50 to 60% chance that we're going to fall in this top third group. And so I want to emphasize that when we say this, this means that we only have a 40 to 50% chance of being in the bottom two groups. And in this case, 
that does line up with normal values for the most part, but oftentimes it doesn't, as you saw in the fall presentation if you were in on that one. So let's break down what this really means. So breaking down this wet and cool winter, you can see that typically during El Nino, some of you may have seen this graphic we posted a few weeks ago, typically we don't have as many days below freezing as we usually do. On the flip side, we also typically don't have as many warm days. And so you, these are the, the blue bars are the ones that are El Nino, the red bars are all others. You can see in general, we typically have about three fewer days that are below freezing during winter during El Nino, and we typically have about half or even less than that, the number of days that are 80 degrees and above. And of course, we have had one 80 degree day already in December. Uh, we may get one more this month, uh, but keep in mind that we're expecting February is probably gonna be definitely cooler than normal. So as we move forward, uh, just keep in mind that this does look like it's a pretty strong term. We won't have as warm temperatures and we probably won't have as many freeze days, mainly because we have a lot more cloud cover in winter. When you look at precipitation, it's not surprising that we expect to have more precipitation during El Nino than non-El Nino years. And so just looking at the number of days, typically we have about 20 to 21 days in Austin and San Antonio during uh, non-El Nino years. We have about 26 during El Nino. So what this is saying is that precipitation usually occurs about twice a week during El Nino winters. Uh, and so keep in mind that we haven't had that many precipitation days in December, so we might make up for that in January and February based on historical records. One other thing to point out is our heavy precipitation events are much more common uh, during El Nino than they are during non-El Nino winters. And so, as you can see here, typically we have about double the number of heavy precipitation events uh, where we have at least half an inch or more, where they happen about twice a month in Austin and San Antonio uh, versus non-El Nino years where they may only happen once a month. So that's a pretty strong correlation there. Uh, sorry, not correlation, but a strong connection there between our rain events and our heavy rain events. Uh, one other thing to point out, about our rainfall is that we are in a strong El Nino. So it makes more sense sometimes to look at the strongest episodes that we've had because we know that we're most likely gonna fall somewhere as number three or number two uh, with once we average out uh, the sea surface temperatures over the whole period uh, for the highest three month period. And so what you're seeing here is that San Antonio, Austin, Mabry, and Del Rio, they all had precipitation totals during our fall that were higher than normal. Uh, typically during strong El Ninos, we kind of see a pattern where it's right around normal. We talked about that in fall, how typically the second part of fall is wet and the first part of fall, and certainly that was the case for us this year. But keep in mind also that we got most of that rain in just a handful of events towards the end of October. Uh, so looking into winter, though, most winters we have greater precipitation than normal connection there. So we do expect that to continue because we've looked at these five strongest El Ninos, and this is an El Nino that's going to be... This is a question we've been getting a lot lately is what chance of snow are we going to have? And for Christmas, the chance is obviously pretty low because our temperatures are so warm. Uh, but mm -hmm. what you see here is that typically Austin and Del Rio, they don't have a strong connection with El Nino. This, this again, the blue bar is El Nino, the red bar is all others. And here I've introduced the climatological yellow bar. What you see here is we have a slight tilt towards more snow and uh, more years we actually have measurable snowfall in the El Nino years for Austin and Del Rio. But what's really impressive here is San Antonio typically has three times a greater chance of getting snow in El Nino years than non-El Nino years. And this also kind of holds if you start looking at Houston uh, and you start looking at Corpus and areas like that. Maybe not three times, but certainly a much more pronounced signal than you see for Austin and Del Rio. And that's most likely because it doesn't take as much to get Austin and Del Rio to get snowfalls as it does in San Antonio. Really need a deep intrusion of cold air. Usually behind a cold front, at least 24 hours, we get the upper level disturbance behind it that causes the snow. One other point here to look at is that the top five snow years we've had since 1950. Here in San Antonio, the only one that was not an El Nino year was our record one, which was back in 1984-85, which was surprisingly El Nino year. And of course, that's the record at all of our stations. But once you get past that, you can see the next four were all El Nino years. And Two of the top three in Austin were El Nino years as well. So that's something to consider when looking at for actually having so much significant snow events for this area, which two inches would be pretty significant for South Central Texas. Then we've also had some questions about severe weather. Uh, if you look at severe weather, this is something that Greg Carbon put together at Storm Prediction Center. He looked at the number of watch days during the 10 strongest El Ninos versus the 10 uh, strongest La Nina years. And so what you see here in South Central Texas is typically, you know, this is how many we had during those 10 years. You see it's roughly a little bit less than one watch a month uh, for these events. But what you see is, what I really want to point out here is at the bottom, 
here in the strongest La, Nina, uh, La Ninas versus the strongest El Nino, as you can see that during El Nino, one thing that's consistent during all seasons for South Central Texas in all months, not all seasons, sorry, all months of winter, although the trend is not as strong in, in February as it is in December and January, is that we typically do have a lot more wash days in the El Nino winters than we do in the La Nina winters. That doesn't hold for much of the rest of the United States during February, but for us, December, January, and even February down further in south into South Central Texas, that holds. And I'll just kind of zoom in a little bit to kind of show you that pretty much along the ECI 35 corridor is where we have the greatest amount of wash days uh, during the strong El Nino winters, and they typically have about two to three wash days in the winter. And so that's something to keep in mind as we progress through the next several weeks. Uh, again, that trend does become weaker in February. Uh, of course, we get to March, some things change, and we'll kind of preview that in just a second. So now I'll get into the, towards the end of our talk here, uh, the South Central Texas Impacts Outlook. I uh, want to compliment Jason Runyon for doing this research. Uh, he has shown that local research uh, basically implies that twice as many severe hail and tornado reports occur during El Nino winters than other years, regardless of whether they're La Nina years or neutral years, where we're not in either La El Nino or La Nina. One thing to kind of notice here is that the uh, severe wind reports don't really show a clear connection. So those may be just more tied to having you know, storms that form along cold front and move through or something of that nature. But in general, the hail reports and the trader reports we get do tend to be much more prevalent in El Nino. So we have kind of slightly above normal conditions through the entire winter uh, for what we typically would see for severe weather uh, this time of year. Our flash flood events are about three times more likely uh, during El Nino winters than other years. And this is even after we take out the record-breaking winter of 91-92, which some of you probably remember, which we had double the amount of rain in that winter than we did in any other winter uh, since 1950. And so, again, uh, when you look at this, it's a pretty strong signal that we still have a potential for heavy rainfall and flooding uh, much longer than usual. We usually wouldn't see this in winter, but we still have that possibility uh, here as we go through mid-January. And then we'll take that back to normal conditions for the second part, but that's mainly because we're expecting cooler temperatures, so it's going to be harder to get the heavy rain rates we typically would get uh, in, 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 uh, with warmer temperatures, because typically in, in January, February, we have cold temperatures, which is one reason why we don't see very many flash flood events there throughout our history. Uh, but as we get through December in the next couple weeks, while we're still in this warmer pattern, it's still not out of the question that that could happen. Fire weather, which was a great big concern back uh, in October when we did this talk, is not nearly as great a concern now, uh, mainly because it's just been so wet the last couple of months. Uh, we have our energy release components have, in this black line, have just really shot down with that Hurricane Patricia event and then the subsequent rainfall that we've seen. And that has continued to stay well below normal. Uh, so even on days where we might be close to red flag criteria and things of that nature for the next couple of weeks, we would still have a low chance of having significant fire weather conditions uh, as long as these stay low. However, as we go into January and February, uh, we could still have some fire risk uh, with these you know, strong fronts that come through that are very dry fronts that have very strong winds just because those are type of fire weather conditions we get during one of our two peak seasons, the other being September, this you know, one being kind of late winter. So we still have to be a little bit concerned about that, but, you know, for the short term, that should not be a major concern. And finally, winter weather, you know, for the next couple of weeks, just because temperatures are going to probably stay warmer than normal, even on into the early part of January, not really expecting anything that's out of the ordinary, just kind of normal winter weather conditions. But certainly as we get into the middle part of January and on into February, we do have a much greater risk than normal for having some snowfall or winter weather this year. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that all these events in blue that happened during El Nino, they all happened in February. Uh, so that's something to really consider when you're going forward, that even if we get to you know, February 1st or even 15th, we may not be out of the blue and out of the dark yet on having a snow event. Uh, the snow events in February 2003 and, and 2010, I do believe, happened on the second half of February. And then that had that ice storm that happened during the AMS conference in San Antonio back in January of 2007. Uh, which happened right in the middle of the month. Uh, even though in 2004, which was the only one of the last four El Nino winters that we did not have uh, winter weather in Austin or San Antonio, we did have that really odd storm that we had down in Corpus Christi in Houston's area, right along the Gulf Coast, where they got upwards of 12 inches of rain, and, uh, sorry, 12 inches of snow in some places uh, on Christmas Eve in 2004. So again, it can happen. It's probably not going to happen this year on Christmas. Uh, but keep in mind that we can get some pretty deep cold air intrusions and some uh, patterns behind it with the upper level disturbances that can cause precipitation and it could take the form of snow or worse, ice. All right, so that's pretty much in this talk. We'll take some questions here in just a second, but just do a quick 
Uh, shameless plug number one for the spring outlook. Next call will probably be during the last part of February, the first half of March. Um, you can see right now we're still looking at cooler than normal conditions and wetter than normal conditions for the March to May period. I will talk more about severe weather where you can see that our severe weather events obviously are more dry line focused out there in March. This is the March map, uh, but looks like we could have a fairly active March too.